What's up, everybody? It's Jeremy, and we are back in the attic, and I'm having so much fun in my world lately because I've always, you know, I love talking to people, and that is so much fun, but I really love talking to really cool people, and so today is another one of those days that I get to hang up in the attic, spend some time with today's guest, who is also living in his van. Go figure. I'm, you know, we're starting to get on kind of a, a routine here. But without further ado, I don't even think that I can properly introduce you the way that you do your own voice. I love it. So I'm turning it over to you on this one. What's up, y'all? James Casino, chocolate man in a van. What's going on, Jeremy? What's up, mate? Oh, my gosh. So I love it. So... <clears throat> I had the awesome opportunity of meeting James in person out at Quartzsite, and uh, it was like instant. I loved just his overall, just his personality and the energy that you brought, um, you know, to our to Quartzsite. I mean, Quartzsite needs more energy <laughs> like that for sure. It really does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you definitely brought it, and um, and I want to be totally like so. You knew of Weld Tech Designs before you came to Quartzsite. Yeah. So Yeah, absolutely. So I started uh, looking at Weld Tech. Of course, as soon as Chrome did it, Van City Van Life, of course. I was like, oh, I always wanted an account online van, and now he's got this five-inch lift on it. Like, where did he get that from? He kept talking about this Weld Tech company. Started Googling it. I got on the keyboard, started figuring out, yep. Yeah, this is pretty cool. And then I saw you guys had Instagram. I saw you guys had a YouTube channel. Let me go follow this dude. Who is this? What's up, everybody? I'm Jeremy from Welter. <laughs> I was like, oh, let me follow this guy. He's pretty cool. I'm digging this guy. Yeah, I started learning about the company. Started learning about what you guys do, what kind of equipment you provide. I was like, yep. If I ever own an Econoline van, I probably want that system on it for yeah. sure. And now go figure. Now, how long ago was that? To fast oh, that forward? had to be what a year and a half, at least two years ago. Whenever Chrome got his, I, I don't we'll remember. We'll get into this more, but how long have you had your van? Oh, right I just now? got my van, so I've only had it since November. So, oh, so this is just like you're on its maiden voyage, yeah. out having a good time. Absolutely. Well, you'll definitely have to go check out the podcast that went live yesterday of Chrome and I. That was a ton of fun. We were just, uh, you know, two kids up here hanging out and, you know, having a good time. But before that, so, like, I always like getting the backstory before this and um, starting to watch now your videos more now after I met you because then I was like, well, I want to know more about this guy. Like, he was super entertaining and funny and dude, I, like, I like you, you know? So uh, I, I was. I hurt you too, man. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm like, I'm watching. So then I think right after that, while I'm in court site still, I watched your tour of the jails in Yuma, you know, going through that. And uh, that I'm like, I, I've driven past that how many times? I never even knew it was there. And now every time I drive past it on the 8, I'm like, I think of you now. So now it's like. Permanent in there, how that goes. Great. Every time Jeremy so, thinks of prison, he thinks of me. Oh, <laughs> you know, there it you is. You say the sweetest thing. There's a things. crazy one in the middle of Arizona. <laughs> so we're going to go back, and I want to start off with a, a quote from you, and this is a verbatim quote. So, supposedly back in the Vietnam War era, many GIs were referred to as Chocolate Man, both for their inability to survive the heat and others because they gave chocolate bars to the locals. Later, this term became associated with the people of color as a playful discrimination, a descriptive term, not descriptive. And most agree it is not meant, meant to be derogative. So tell me about that. Where did you start to learn about that? Where was that? Was that something that you, you know, became more aware of once you were in the military? That's something that I figured out after visiting Southeast Asia many times. I heard that term kind of loosely you don't hear it as much these days but you know when i first started going to southeast Asia, you'd hear that term a lot and i kind of wanted to know what the history was so i looked it up you know there's some wiki facts and that type of thing and there's some other people that talk about it but yeah that was the basic gist i actually put that blurb on my website which is where your sneaky guy got it from but uh yeah that uh 
that is exactly it. It's it's meant to be descriptive, which is what a lot of Asian people, you know, Southeast Asia, you spend a little time over there, you learn that that's how they relate to Americans is in a very descriptive way, in a very literal way as well. They learn and they understand us better from that literal standpoint. So they use the term like chocolate man because that's exactly what they would either see or understand that person to be. So if I gave you a chocolate bar, oh, that's the guy that the guy gives us chocolate. So that's a chocolate man or uh, a dark skinned person. Oh, they remind me of chocolate. So that's a chocolate man. But yeah, not meant to be derogative in any sense or term or, or form or the way it's just just the way they talk it's like the milkman yeah exactly you know? I mean, that's the guy that brings the milk dude that brought milk <laughs> yeah, you know like exactly you, you you brought fresh chocolate and i'm sure that that was something that you know they enjoyed and loved and then it was like okay this is great and then also associating with it i guess you know with the skin color yes so um i know that you're traveling you know in the united states so before we i wanted to know where are you at right now currently i'm in los angeles california Okay. Yep. Now, you like L.A.? Are you a oh, fan of no. L.A.? Oh, no. I'm not a city oh, boy okay. by any term whatsoever. No, I'm only here to visit a very good friend of mine that I know from the Internet. Might want to check him out. Zoom to Thailand. I don't know if you guys want to throw that in there and let him know. What's up? Give him a plug. But, yeah. Hey, you just threw it in there, yep. so now he will definitely know. That's my boy, Richie Mack. I'm actually sitting out in front of his house. We've been hanging out. I'm only here for a couple of okay. days, and then I'm... I'm back to the jungle, back to the forest, back to the mountains, back to the trees, the birds, the squirrels, all that. That's where nature is my spot, especially when I'm in the States. Okay. Nature is absolutely my thing. I've been, mm, it's been the best part of this journey is getting back into nature. So yes, no, LA is not my thing. So now I'm assuming that during your 23 years in the Air Force that you got to be, was that more nature, more base time. Like what did that, what did the majority of your career in the military as an air, as being in the air force? Thankfully only the first five years of my career were actually sat in one place, not doing anything that exciting. I was just aircraft maintenance. I didn't really do anything special, but after that I became an aerial gunner on AC one thirties, got to fly around, do some kind of cool stuff there. I did that for about five years, got a little bit of combat time, you know, got involved in the, in the global war on terrorism, got involved in the Afghanistan war and all that stuff. Got to do a little of that. That was kind of interesting. Got a little bit of travel. But when I became a C-17 loadmaster, that's when my world kind of exploded. And I got to travel. And I went to something like, I don't know, 40 or 50 different countries within uh, about a 12-year period. And it was phenomenal. So how old were you when you joined the Air Force? So I joined the Air Force when I was 19. So I got out of school when I was 18, obviously. Spent about a year messing around, driving my mother crazy. And yeah, finally at 19, she kind of had enough. She's like, you can join the military or you can live on the streets, but you aren't going to live here. So yeah, I joined the military. And now where did you grow up at? Where uh, are you I from? I grew up in a little town in Washington. So a little okay. cool little logging town. But yeah, it was an interesting life growing up there. So 23 years in the Air Force, and then you were saying the last part of the Air Force is where you really got to enjoy the time. Um, and now, what was that position? So my last, uh, what, oh, what was it, 12, 15 years in the military, I was on a C-17 as a loadmaster. I basically took care of cargo and people in the back okay. of the airplane. So good times. But that was like, it seems like, I mean, your whole face lighted up when you were started talking about that. Like that was like, yeah, you were passionate about it. Seems like you really enjoyed your job. So with that being said, like what made you get out? Yeah, it just got to the point where, you know, I had I was a uh, I was a little bit I wasn't super rank heavy, but I had enough rank that, you know, they didn't really want me to go out and fly and see the world anymore. They wanted me to stay home and do administrative type things. And yeah, that wasn't for me. <laughs> Sitting that, in an office okay. has never been my thing. So, yep. It was time to time to leave. I had enough time to uh, retire, and uh, my time was up at my last base in Hawaii. I was like, I'm out of here, guys. Uh, here's my paperwork. I'll, I'm rolling. I'll catch you all later. Gotcha. Now, is your mom still with us? Yes, my mom's still out there. She still lives in my hometown back in Washington. She's doing great. So now, do you now go back and be like, hey, mom, thanks for uh, you know putting a boot in my ass, because okay. if you didn't, I would not have. Because I'm assuming like now you have a, a great pension, like all of the benefits now that you have, you know, for serving our country for that length of time, which, you know, big thank you for doing that. Now you get to reap the benefits of your hard work, which I'm hoping is paying off because now you get to really enjoy your life at, how old are you now? Whew, just turned 50. 
Okay. Hey, I'm going to be there this year. So you're a 74 baby. 73. Yeah. Oh, so when, when was your birth? Oh, okay. Yep. So, yeah, uh, this is my year. I will be 50. But um, I mean, like, I couldn't even imagine being able to retire now and like, okay, I mean, how amazing <laughs> that is. So I know that people say it's not for everybody, but man, when I look at it like that, you got to not only see the world on somebody else's dime, but, you know, got paid for it and now get to keep getting paid for it. So that is something that is pretty awesome. And now I know something else that you talk about is then investing and you are big into investing. Now, are you personally like, do you enjoy trading or you are just like strictly like, um, an ETF type person, like what is it that you're into? Yeah, I'm a hands off guy. I started out with uh, Betterment and I started out with Schwab. Well, originally it was USA, then it turned into Schwab. But anyway, those, both Schwab's those Schwab's buying everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so Schwab, USA, and uh, Betterment, they all are automated. So yeah, I'm okay. way too lazy and not smart enough to deal with finances. But they've been doing great for me. I just uh, I just throw my money in there. You know, I told them, you know, my level, you, you can adjust your amount of risk, how much you're going right. to invest every month, you know, this, that. You can, you know, do I want more stocks? Do I want more bonds? Blah, blah, blah. Whatever. You can adjust it how you want. Mine, all my stuff is pretty much just medium right along the line. And it does great. It does great. And now are you trying to use that as like a, a secondary income? Like are you using that as um you know, income as far as which you can live off of, or are you strictly relying on your pension and that's kind of like a remote savings? I pretty much tell everybody, you know, since I have a government pension, I have money coming in already. I'm pretty much just got that money to make my nephew rich. <laughs> there you go. So, I mean, he's going to appreciate that. But I think that that's something important. And I think that that is something that I wish was even taught in school, just the pure fact of start investing now even at a young age because just that compounding interest like you say even if you don't want to touch it you don't want to do anything it's there it's growing it's you know an emergency fund a you know build my crazy van i never thought i would build fund whatever it may be as long as you start it and start doing something i'm just going to say i feel that that's super important so you know, when you talked about that, I think that that was something that I was like, okay, um, it's you know, it's yeah. great. I think more young people need to know yeah. about it. And I don't try to be preachy about it or anything like that. I'm just like, hey, um, you know, I wish I'd have known about this when I was right out of high school. I never that something that irritates me to no end is that we don't learn about the stock market, we don't learn about credit, these type of things. And I don't know if they're doing it now, but when we went no, to high school, no, they're still not. Like yeah, it's my daughter's in high school, and it's like. Do they teach you how to balance a checkbook? Like, do you know anything about the stock market? Do you know anything about retirement? Like, do you know how to go and open up a bank account? You know, like, do you know how to start establishing credit? Like none of these main things are even like, we're so like, oh, you need to know this about science. You know, that's like, how is that really going to help me truly succeed unless I became like a science major and here's where all this is going, but I'm like, no matter what, to have that foundation and to have like a really good foundation in that is going to help carry you so far. It's just, I don't know how it's not just necessary part of the academic yeah, of absolutely. today's high school. It almost seems so. like there's a scam out there. Hmm. <laughs> nah, I think that's going to be a whole nother, yeah, a whole nother uh, podcast for you and yeah, I. I think that that would be, I would love that because uh, I'm thinking we're reading the same book, you know? <laughs> so now we're talking about money and finances and that's going to lead me to one big thing and I noticed this is this other country, not in the United States, Thailand, which is a big part of your life. So what made you go to Thailand 
And um, yeah, I mean, let's start with that. Yeah, so Thailand, Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, whatever, South, basically all Southeast Asia. I've been visiting there for well over 20 years, usually on vacation, just hanging out with my friends, having a good time, short stays and whatnot. But the real power of it is after I retired in 2016, I moved directly to the Philippines. Like 24 hours after I retired, I was on a plane, jet set, Philippines, living that life super super low cost of living it's a different lifestyle living in asia there's a lot of things we can talk about there but as far as financial that's the first thing that most people are going to look at is that is an, an amazing way to extend your dollar is by living in one of these foreign countries and the philippines and thailand are perfect examples of countries who really embrace having Americans there, making the visa process somewhat basic, making it you know manageable, whatnot. Spend a lot of time there, invest your money there. They appreciate you being there. So yeah, that was that was just easy math for me. You know, other than the other many, many other tangible benefits that go along with it. Initially, the biggest thing for me was financing. And I was just, man, my money goes so much farther there. So how far does it go? So like if we were to say I want to have like a decent apartment. I'm living by myself in a safe neighborhood. What does rent cost per month in Thailand? So for me, the place I was living in was very nice in Thailand. It was very primo. I pay $700 a month. Which an equivalent to that here. And since you're in LA, heck, let's use LA. But what do you think something like that same thing would go for in LA? No less than $3,000 a month. No less. So crazy Not even, savings. Yep. And I, I don't even know if I could get it for three. I'd be lucky Which to get it Which is nuts, three. you know. Oh, I mean, don't get me wrong. Housing is, um, you know, out of control here in the U.S. Yeah. And then the next big thing is just going to be food, you know, clothes. But now, was that any kind of adaption, like getting used to their food? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's not America. So they, they cook right. their food. You know, Philippines, Thailand, either way, they eat. They eat what they eat, so you're just going to have to adapt. However, of course, westernization, things like McDonald's, Burger King, things like that are all available over there. They don't taste quite the same. They're a little bit off, but, you know, it's the same corporation. It's still good. So you can still get it. And there's plenty of Westerners over there that open Western restaurants or open European okay. restaurants or whatnot from their country. So you can always get a little taste of home. It's not perfect, but you can always get a taste of home. Yeah, because that's kind of the same thing. I feel like people are always like... I love Mexican food here in Southern California and anywhere else you go, it's not the same kind of Mexican food. So I can imagine, it, you know, the similarities yet differences. But now while we're in Thailand, let's talk about Mike Taxi. I'm going to, how do am I going to say this? Mataya? Mike and Taxi. This is your, per, what, one, say it for me. Mike Taxi Pattaya. Okay. And now this is your, uh, this is your, preferred transportation service over there in Bangkok. Now, why? What made, what is that all about? Hi, my name is Caden Johnson and I'm 10 years old. I really love working with tools in the garage with my dad. So I thought it would be a great idea to teach other kids about tools. And that's the idea where Growing Up Garage came from. Kids used to learn about tools in shop class. They got rid of those. In our workshop, we're gonna teach you about tools that you can use in your everyday life, like a Phillips head screwdriver or a ratchet and socket. Don't forget the very useful wrench. This and so much more at your next Growing Up Garage workshop. What's great about Growing Up Garage is it's taught by kids like me. On the behalf of Growing Up Garage, thank you for your consideration. Yeah, so been using mics for, oh man, it's got to be 10, 15 years I've been using mic. Mic is just super reliable. You, you, you either send an email, you send a text, whatever way you get a hold, you get a, send them a message on Facebook, whatever you're going to do. If you've never been to Thailand, if you've never been to Thailand before and you want to get from the airport to anywhere in Thailand, these guys are going to hook you up. They're going to be there waiting for you. They're going to have a big sign with your name on it. You're gonna get you in the cab and they're gonna tell you their prices up front. There's no guesswork. There's no, oh, hey, uh, I told you 2,000 baht, but now it's gonna be 3,000 baht. No, no, none of that's gonna happen. You know exactly up front. So yeah, when it's reliable like that, when it's guaranteed like that, they're always on time, they're always professional. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and recommend that company all day. And now why Pattaya over Bangkok? Pattaya, so Pattaya. Pattaya. 
Bataya originally was kind of like a, a hangout for sailors and, and uh, other military members. Back towards the end of the Vietnam War, they would go there to do their R&R, &R, things like that. Kind of like how Vegas got started. You know, people were just looking for a place to hang out and have a good time. Since then, it's obviously exploded dramatically and is known as one of the biggest party towns in Asia, pretty much. And now I know that that whole area is huge in like the martial arts, especially Muay Thai. Um, now, is that like really as big as it's made out to be over there? Uh, for Muay Thai, for a lot of Thais, is a staple of life. They, 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 you know, from like six, seven years old, they start learning Muay Thai. They find out who the guys are going to be good. And then that guy, you know, he'll work odd jobs. He'll raise a family. He'll do other things. But Muay Thai will be the main focus of his life until he's probably well into his 40s. It's very and now, good. is that something where they only have fights in certain things? I mean, I know we were talking about it just in before this, and it's like like coffee shops and random places. Like, it's is it is it just kind of like a break dancing sort of thing where people are dancing, but like, and you know, some dude playing the guitar on the street corner, you know, here over there, it's like, or is it? all like controlled and sanctioned or what how does that work over there like just everyday life or what, what do you think what do you know just when it comes to that muay thai being such an important aspect of their life like is it i guess i would say is like where's the craziest place that you have you gone to these muay thai fights yeah absolutely and then like where's the craziest place that you've seen one or are they all in like you go to an arena a stadium yeah or something like that yeah they're okay. almost always in an arena stadium they don't just randomly okay. muay thai in the, in the streets or anything like that it's that's what like, i that's yeah. yeah so it yeah so it's not like a dance mob in the street no, they're no. like hey all of a sudden we're gonna have this little setup here and you know like yeah. the backyard brawls or the now if you pick, homeless if you mess with the wrong tie guy which you don't want to do if you want to mess with the wrong tie guy he might show you some movie tie in the streets but yeah it won't yeah be that. <laughs> that's not what you want to have right so now that's gonna go into so now you are single not single these days oh i'm, I'm very much with my girlfriend i've been with her for okay. over four you, nearly four years now we've been together so yeah, okay the same how place. did you guys meet then so we met we we knew each other around patia for probably a year before we even started okay. dating we were just friends and uh, you know the situation changed between me and a girlfriend i had before we broke up and you know me and fa had been talking for a long time we got along well and then the next thing you know we were dating we were both very drama very hands-off just kind of wanted to enjoy each other's company and hang out and yeah next thing you know it was a relationship and we've been together for almost four years so now how long have you how long has it been since you were back in thailand uh i left in november so yeah, okay a few months so since then so because i was watching some of the videos like where you guys went down to the beach and all the pink stuff and <laughs> just like all like craziness you know it was like i think you were saying like it's a little bit of pink overload but she was like super into it and just having a good old time and I was at first, I think that might have been the first video then like where I saw her and didn't completely understand the dynamic. The first thing that caught my attention was like the crazy nails. <laughs> like her nails were so long. I was like, oh my gosh, like like Freddy Krueger. I mean, how long? Those things got to be a few inches, right? Like four yeah. or five? Yeah, now, they used to be about three inches, but she's, she's actually okay. wearing shorter ones now. But that was just her thing. She's just... Fa is one of those girly girls who likes to, you know, she's really big on her fashion and everything like that. It's not a big thing for her. It's not like, oh my God, I can't leave my house without, you know, looking a certain way. No, she just likes to look cute when she goes down. So that's, that's her I thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing, yeah. you know? I was just like, I mean, of course, I'm going to go to the first thing. I'm like, it would be really hard to wipe with those nails, <laughs> you know? Like, I'm like... I would end up hurting myself it, it's with fun, that. It's fun to watch her, how she has to manipulate the world to work around her nails. You know, uh, like I said, they're okay. shorter now, but, you know, just the way she would open things or do things, you know, she just adapted very well. How she types on her phone, everything is just, yep, she's just like almost like yeah, a person no. with a handicap. They just adapt. <laughs> now, do you guys feel like being, having like two significant, you know, cultural, like, um, do you feel like there's huge differences between it or it's just like you guys are both so easygoing and fun that it doesn't even matter and like once you're together so i do consultations and i talk to men about this stuff all the time and the one thing i, I let them know is that 
it's more likely they'll adapt to you before you adapt to them. But you do at some point have to give a little, you know, you can't just always take. But yeah, it's not hard at all to get into that culture, live in that culture, understand what to do, what not to do, how to be sensitive to it. But usually your partner, when you get a Thai partner, Filipino partner, just mostly generally, you know, just generally speaking in Asia, your partner usually will adapt to you to, to the biggest degree. So they're going to bend a little bit more your way because they know they understand that you don't know how that thing works or that you didn't grow up in their type of family or type their type of religion or their food or any of that type of thing. So, yeah, it's really easy for them to just kind of adapt to you or teach and you. And now how is her English? Her English is amazing. So she taught okay. herself how to read and speak English just from watching TV and seeing it. Now she can read and speak it, which is crazy for me. A lot of times right. learn, you know, enough conversational English to do stuff, but they can't read it and write it. She can read and write as well. Now, are you trying to learn what language is their main language there? Thai. So, and okay, so yeah, it is, my, can, I got, no, there's, I'd have to kick a lot of penguins off the island for me to learn Thai. Yeah, Thai is it's not happening. It's a tonal language, which means, you know, one word can mean a lot of things. It's just how you say it. And okay. it's impossible. <laughs> that ain't so, happening for this guy. You mentioned that a lot, you that you do consulting with like other men that go over there. Um, and I know that, you know, my interpretation, what I've seen of Thailand, I mean, I love the beaches. I would love to go there and go scuba diving. So maybe that's, you know, something that, you know, I'm going to have to hit you up and be like, hey, when's the next trip? I want to go dive over there. But like, I know that it's another place where a lot of single men go to meet women or potential wives as well, correct? Yep, absolutely. That's that's and, just the way it is. I mean, that's it's always been that way. Southeast Asia is a great heaven for, or a great haven for lonely guys or introverted guys or guys who, you know, don't really know how to deal with maybe a Western style woman. So Asia is a great place to go. Does to any man own. really know how to deal with a Western? <laughs> hey, hey, you hey, know, hey, I mean, come I don't on. Want your wife here in this later. <laughs> oh, she knows. She's like. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how you put up with me, period. <laughs> so not that you, you know, so I want to know, so having the experience. So um, let's say I'm looking for my next ex-wife and I go over there. Like, what is, how does that work? And like, what does something like that cost? Yeah, I mean, well, money's not that big a fact. You're not going to spend any more money than you would in a normal relationship, you know. So it's not like you go over and pay a dowry or something like that or, hey, okay. i got to, you know, establish a financial situation with this person before I can date them. What I tell guys all the time is, is as soon as you get over here, you meet a girl wherever you meet her. You know, you might meet her in a restaurant. You might meet her in a bar. You might meet her in a mall, whatever. Wherever you meet her, whatever you do, if you really like each other, you're spending time to get time with each other you got to sit down and have that talk about what's expected because what can happen in some southeastern relationships what can happen is that the woman might assume that you're going to take care of her you're going to take care of their family they're going to do this they're going to do that never allow assumptions to get into the relationship always sit down and have that talk and like hey baby you know I don't know where we're going. I don't know what's happening next. I want to spend time with you, but what do you expect from me? You know, and what can I expect from you? What are we going to do for each other in this relationship? And that's, that's, I think a lot of guys make a mistake and they do get themselves in an unusual situation where they might be taking care of children that don't belong to them, might be taking care of family that, that, you know, they may have never met or something like that, or the farm animals or whatever. Lots of weird things going to happen, right? But you just really got to decide if that partner is the right fit for you and don't ever just be honest like they respond to honesty way better than you would think if you just be frank with them so uh and just don't get yourself in a financial situation because that can happen some guys get themselves in a difficult financial situation sometimes don't let that happen so i definitely want to hear more about this because i think that there's i think that there's the relationship and also like paid aspect of it because i think that that has become very popular too where you can buy a wife, you know, like <laughs> yes. in a, in a sort of, you know, way. But I mean, I love hearing about that. We're going to take a break for just a second. And then we're going to be coming back with the one and only James Casino, better known as chocolate man in a van. We'll be back in just a minute. All right. So we are back here in the attic. I'm having a good time. I'm learning all about Thailand 
from the one and only James Casino Chocolate Man in a Van. And I should just really have you do that intro every time because you do it so much better than I do. Um, but I guess that's like my what's up, everybody kind of thing, you know, just having a good old time. So I know, would you say then we're talking about just the um, the women in Thailand and how that's how you met your girlfriend and really the difference between that, like, pay to play versus like you can really meet a genuinely nice person. And I would say kind of the same thing would be here in San Diego, even where I live. It's like, yeah, you can go to, you know, a bar and meet somebody. Um, but you could also go to church and meet somebody or a restaurant or a Starbucks and that totally different type of person. Um, however, you do see that, like, do you feel that Thailand gets a bad rap of like all the women there are just like, prostitutes you know or yeah that's that's the thought that's usually the forefront that's the first thing that people think of when they see you know because uh, there's a billion videos and things with the red light districts and Pattaya and and other places throughout asia and whatnot that, that automatically paint women in this uh submissive subservient type of life and that uh, you know you just go over there and pick a girl off the tree and take her with you and you just pay off her family and, and go with it and it's it's nothing like that at all. It's absolutely ridiculous to think that people live like that or or do things like that. You know, now some gentlemen will go over there and they're only looking for a paid situation, but it's the same thing they would have done in Vegas or or many other places around the world. So, for some reason that area, that's all people assume that the women are, which is really or not all that all people, but that's what some people think that all the people in Thailand or all the women are like in Thailand. And it's not couldn't be farther from the truth. There's millions and millions of normal regular old women just who would be interested in dating a foreign man if they happened to meet one that was nice enough so it's because there you have an amazing accent where here we just sound normal and goofy pretty much pretty much we are you no know, so <laughs> yeah so then i know i was asking so you don't know when you're going back to thailand because you're enjoying it you know, over here, I did have another question about it, and it's the big C superstores in Thailand. It seems like that they do like random dancing and flash mobs. Um, I mean, now, like, is that kind of one of those internet things again, or is that like really a way how it is? So, in Thailand, most people are pretty reserved, so they don't really do flash mobs, but they may you know, decide one day, hey, we're gonna go dance here in the mall or we're gonna do some kind of show or something like that. But I don't think it'd really be a flash mob situation. It'd be something pre-coordinated, probably talk to the manager type thing. But they are a vibrant and fun people. They like to have fun, they like to sing, they like to dance, they like to do things like that. So yeah, it's not uncommon to see that in a mall though. That's a perfect place to catch something like that as well. Which is always wild to me. So how far when you were saying you had that ideal house there in thailand how far are you from the water in your 700 dollars a month house i can see the water from my my condo no problem i can see it right off my balcony and you know maybe if i was gonna walk maybe seven minutes to walk to the water if i was walking so pretty horrible then. yeah it was absolutely yeah, sounds rough. For 700 dollars yeah, a month i mean i don't know how you would survive that I, for 700 dollars. i don't recommend and, it you know you you may just no, want to stay definitely. there forever yeah so, and the water is just amazing. It's pretty good. I mean, you see, you see like both. So that's where you see like some places where it's like you would never want to swim in it, touch it. But then other places where it's like so blue that it's like, to me, I always say it's like almost looks purplish and like starts <laughs> to, you know, depending on the coral and things that are living underneath yeah. it. Is that the same case there? Unfortunately, Pattaya, the beaches are, they're really nice to sit on and look at. I wouldn't necessarily swim okay. in the water right off the coast. However, we do have an island that only takes 30 okay. minutes to get to, and it costs $1 to ride the boat out there. Get on that island, and then that island does have a tropical okay. aura to it. It has beautiful blue water, white sandy beaches. You know, that's 30-minute ride from Pattaya, and for a buck, you can't beat it. Now, could you live in a van in Thailand? You could. There's nothing stopping you. You could do it, but unfortunately, is that it, it's just not a thing there. Uh, there are very. There's a few people that do it. They're actually living in like camper vans and you know modified camper vans that type of thing. But the humidity is the big okay. would be a big problem. Also, accommodations are extremely cheap. 
you can stay in a hotel room for fifteen dollars all over the but, place. So, but what if I want a different episode of this where it's Chocolate Man in a van in Thailand? Yeah, unlikely. <laughs> no, I'm, ain't happening. My friends call me Gucci Boy. They're actually surprised that I live in a van, but I've set this van up to be pretty comfortable for me. But yeah, I'm not the guy in Thailand. I spend you know forty, fifty dollars a night in hotel rooms because I want a nice, super nice room. So okay, yep. Yeah. Now. So let's talk about that since we're on the van now. Is it living in a van? Is it close to the same cost as, you know, Thailand prices? Or are you spending more still now here? America's ridiculous. Even the- <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's I've never done anything so expensive, but I wanted to give Is this living a shot, in a van. Yes, it's absolutely ridiculous. The gas prices alone will kill you, you know. Well, especially here on the West Coast, yeah. and even more so in California. I mean, it's like crazy when you go to Arizona and it's like as soon as you cross the border, the gas is a dollar less. And you're like, for what reason? <laughs> exactly. You know? Other than our governor, you know, <laughs> at, adding some money onto it, you know, just because, <laughs> you know, he's got stuff going on. Uh-oh. I mean, so that's just, you know, so I'm just curious because I talked to other people. Um, we talked to the slow roamers. Uh, last week and even them they were letting you know saying you know it costs between thirteen hundred and two thousand dollars you know per person um there are a couple so they're spending maybe three thousand dollars a month to live in their van which to me is like you're living in a closet and it's still three grand i mean of course now three grand in some areas still only gets you a closet um, and not even food, especially when you're in like the Bay Area, even maybe parts of L.A. Um, you know, it is really expensive to live. So if you were to look at what you think it costs you on average on a month, depending on how much you're traveling, what do you feel like you're spending? Oh, I'm easily above three. I'm probably closer to four, maybe four or five, because I drive around a lot. I'm not doing van life because I need to. I'm not doing van life for financial reasons and whatnot. So I'm very... Uh, frivolous with my money. I, I kind of, yeah, I'm not doing it the right way. If I wanted to buckle down. I heard you complain about the admission price at the jail. You were like, yep. I can't believe I paid this. Yep. And then by the end of it, you were like, okay. It was worth it. Yeah. And I do. I yeah, complain yeah. about money, but then I spend it left and right. So it's it's whatever. So you're having <laughs> fun and enjoying it. Yep. I mean, hey, it's well-deserved. I mean, you've definitely, you know, you've earned it. So, I, you know, you got to have fun. Now, I've been watching some of the videos and it's like, you're just, I can see why you spend so much money in gas because I'm like, you're in a different place, a different place, a different place. Okay. Like just watching you in the video where you just traveled back through Quartzsite, except you were just, you were the caboose behind this red van the whole time. I'm like, can you just pass this guy? Just, you know, I know you guys were together, but I still was like, you know, we definitely got a good shot of his uh, the rear bumper set up on, on uh, you know, his van. However, I'm like, we got to get you equipped with a weld tech setup. So then it would have been, I know you were complaining about, man, this road is a little bumpy going up to that camp spot. You know, we want to double the speed of that going up there, you know, and having fun. But uh, I mean, that's what's amazing, though, is like all the cool places that you're getting to go to. Um, which are extremely accessible by the majority of people. Like you watch some of these van life people and they're like, Oh, I'm in Alaska. And you're like, yeah, cool. I mean, you're in a place that I'm like, Oh, that's, that's only an hour, an hour's drive. Like that's doable. Like weekend, even doable. Yeah, absolutely. I saw you guys. And I ended up, deciding to just go for it and get the five inch Baja grocery getter kit with the Fox shocks and the progressive leaf springs in the rear. I cannot explain how much better the van is now. It drives like an entirely new vehicle. And there you have it. This is the completed WellTech Designs Baja grocery getter five inch lift kit. Here's a little before and after. Yeah, and that is a cool transformation. All right, today's the day when we're taking the Weld Tech Designs Baja Grocery Getter Kit out of the garage, putting it on the van. Like an injured bird, needing a nest, 
a place to rest. All in all, I am very pleased with the lift. It is super crazy, it's super fun. We've taken it out on multiple camping trips already. Everywhere I go, people stop me and go, what in the heck is up with this thing? I'm driving down the road and you'll see dudes like rubbernecking trying to check it out. It's crazy. I park it at work and people are just blown away with it. Are you kidding me? In that van? On an ATV trail? So let me tell you, it was so good to put those KO2 tires that are on my van and that Weltec lift kit to the test. First time ever I've had it out here and done something like that. Treated this thing like a go-kart with a Weltec Designs Baja Grocery Getter lift kit. Rolling around in your uh, in your van there, taking a little trip with the family, and I was like, oh yeah, that's good stuff. And that's exactly what kids need today. They need to, okay, we're not going to stay in the city. We're not going to go to the movies. We're not going to play video games today. We're going to go out into the woods and have a good time in our big camper van and have a good time. I thought that was awesome. I'm really glad that you do that with your kids. I thought that was great. And for me, man, yeah, the Roman and seeing everything is, that's life for me. I love it. I love it. That's why I don't care about the cost. I'm just like, I'm out here to see the country, do everything, and realize that there is stuff in your backyard all the time that you can go and visit and see and do. You know, you don't have to hang out on the weekends at no, home. No, there, there is. There's so many places. I mean, I think it's funny. Even sometimes here in San Diego, we'll be like, okay, let's go find one touristy thing to do. Like, so we did like the seal bus or an old town tour. And I'm like, we've been to old town, you know, dozens of times, but let's go take the tour to really just see like, if we weren't from here, what it's like, you know, you just kind of, to me, I'm like, I want to be fun, silly, do something like that. My kids think I'm nuts. <laughs> and um, you did mention that. So do you know kids for you? No, just me. No plan. Yep. Just you. Yep. Just, uh, and I just got my mom up in Washington. I got a nephew as well, but. Yeah, I don't see them that, too who's, often. Who's going to inherit all this? You yeah. Know, he's the, so no brothers, no sisters either. Now, I have a younger brother, but I haven't seen him in a long time. So I'm not, he's okay. doing his own thing. Gotcha. So, um, and I'm sorry I'm skipping around here. Uh, this is a story of my life. I'm kind of <laughs> so scatterbrained. But I'm like, I just made me think of like Fa and all of her tattoos. So... Explain to me, did she used to have a tat? Was it her arm that it's like, it's all black now, right? Yep. Was there a tattoo and then it got covered up or that, is that like a cultural thing? No, no, you got to catch up on the videos, guys. No. See? So what they're doing is, so she did the full blackout and now they're redoing the tattoo in white ink. So it's kind of like the tattoo uh, that was underneath it, but now it's all in white ink. And it looks kind of cool. It's really different, you know? So basically the tattoo has been inverted. Okay. I mean, I'm going to have to say it's always weird to me. I'm like, so I have, you know, tattoos and they're all color and crazy. So I could, you know, I'm always like, do you have tattoos? I just got the one. Yep. Just one little, little tiger okay. on my arm. Little panther. Okay. So yeah. Now all black though. No color. Nah. Just now you, so, cause now that was the same thing as all her tattoos were pretty much all black yep. too. Yep. Right. All black. So, I'm always curious, like, what, you know, and I mean, just why people go color, black and white, you know, obviously personal preference, you know, just fun. So now having her have all these tattoos, has it made you want to get more? Are you done? Will you keep, like, what is... I've always wanted more tattoos, but I cannot, I can never make up my mind what I want. Never. I've seen You're like, thousands of tattoos. I like that tattoos. today. Yeah, I've seen thousands then, of but tattoos. Tomorrow, I, can, I can never figure it out. Like, do I want this? Do I want that? Uh, nah. <laughs> and it, yeah. You just don't even know. Yep, it always is. Like, yeah. oh, tomorrow maybe. Tomorrow maybe. Yeah. Maybe when I'm 80, I'll, but, I'll finally get some new tattoos. There you go. And then, you know, you'll have all kinds of just easy real estate. Maybe you won't <laughs> feel it as much, you know, while they're tattooing it. Yep. Um, so you purchased your van in November. And you came up with the name Honey. Why Honey? Oh, I don't know what it is about this van. This van attracts stinging insects, usually bees. Like 90% <laughs> of the time, it's bees. Okay. I, went, I was sleeping in a parking lot at some grocery store. I was sleeping next to a, like a hedge. I got up in the morning, and I was doing the walk around on my van, make sure, you know, no tires are flat or whatever. And I looked at the hood of my van, and there was at least four bees you know, you know, bees go inanimate when they get cold. Right. So there was four like inanimate bees just sitting on my hood. And I, I was like, why? 
And then I went around to the side and there was a couple more just attached to the side, just hanging out there. I'm just like, why? And then subsequently, you know, over the next month or two, it kept happening. Like I would just find bees randomly all over my van. I was like, yep, it's honey. I'm going to van honey. That's awesome. Yep. And so what are the big kind of things that you've done to your van? Um, because it's really overall, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Like no build. There is no build in here. I could literally take everything out of this van in like 30 minutes. You know, that's what I've noticed. Yep. So, and that's what I think is awesome because so many people start to think like, I got to do this crazy build and I got to have all this stuff. And I think back about the reason I got a van circa 2001 is when I got my first Ford Econoline. It was my 1997 Ford Econoline. It was four years old. And half of the reason that I got it was because I could just go wherever I wanted and just sleep in it. I didn't have a build out. I didn't have a toilet and all this kitchen in it and cabinets. It was like, I got a bed, an air mattress. I can put my motorcycle in the back. I'm good. I'll go wherever I want. Like I'm going to go ride bikes today. I'm going to go wherever I, I'm camp on the beach because nobody, you know, was not a problem. I didn't want to get a hotel room. And I mean, to be honest, part of it was like, I couldn't afford a hotel. So it was a way to go out and go travel and, you know, be able to stay in places. I mean, I drove up the coast, you know, it was like stayed in places all the way up the coast and um, lived van life before it was cool or van life. It was just, hey, me traveling, me and my girlfriend, we're going to go do this and, uh, you know, get to go see cool places that we couldn't afford to go do um, if we were staying in hotels the whole time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it, you know, I love how people act like van life is a new thing. Nah, it's been around for like 80 years or something. <laughs> yeah. People have been sleeping in their cars for as long as there's been cars. It was just like the trendy new way of being like, I'm like, aren't you going camping? No, I'm going overlanding. I'm like, yeah, isn't that camping? <laughs> you know, like pretty sure you're going camping. Yeah. Yeah. But I have to drive down a dirt road eight miles to get to the camp spot that I want to get to. And I'm like, okay, cool to go camp there. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay. You know, exactly. like, I mean, I love it. I mean, I love building vans. I have so much fun doing it. Um, but some of it's like, oh, I, I always hear like, oh, I want to do that one day. And I love that that one day to you is now today every day having fun getting out there and just doing it absolutely so what made you start documenting all of this because you were documenting this on youtube way before van life because obviously we have videos you know way before this so what made you decide hey i'm gonna go when i go back to the u.s i'm gonna keep doing this like what is it that you're passionate about? What do you like about sharing your experiences? Yeah, I started vlogging back in 2020 when COVID started. And now it's it's not like an addiction, but I just feel like I have this audience now that I feel like I should always share with. They're my friends. The people, my viewers, my, uh, my subscribers and whatnot are my friends. I feel like they're always on the journey with me. That's why when I'm talking to the camera, I'm talking directly to them. I'm not talking at them. I'm talking to them. Like, you're with me on this journey. So I enjoy sharing that with my people as, as often as I can. Five, six times a week, I'm putting videos out and uh, sharing with my audience and I enjoy it. it's the feedback I don't I don't make a ton of money I'm not gonna be I'll probably never be a big YouTube celebrity or anything like that but I will always have those inter interactions and I've made a ton of really good friends off of YouTube so yeah there's no reason to stop now I'm gonna keep grinding baby so wreck it Ralph says don't read the comments how do you feel about the comments you get that negative sort of stuff or I mean how's it been for you and you know, your audience or even the random people that come by your audience, you know, into your videos. Like, how has that been overall? Yeah, like 1% of negative comments or you get like 1% of my comments are about or negative comments. And 1% of that 1% is like super derogatory, nasty comments. But for the most part, we usually just ignore them. But we do try to like if it, it was some good feedback or it was something that maybe somebody didn't under, you know, they make a, made a comment, but they didn't really understand what's going on in my life 
or what's going on with other people. We'll explain it. You know, some people are like, oh, you shouldn't talk about the negative comments and you're just bringing in trolls. No, I think there's legitimately some negative comments that actually have good feedback or maybe something I can clear up. You know, and the really derogatory stuff and the trolls, we just ignore them. It's no big deal. Just No, I mean, yeah. I totally could see that yeah. because I think even for myself, um, sometimes I get so passionate about like what I may be talking about that I don't show it or I don't explain it enough. I confuse people. So, I mean, I can I can see it both ways, you know, like trying to, you know, not only learn from them, but it's like you always are going to have certain people. It's like, yeah, whatever. You hate your life. I get it. And you wish my life was miserable like you. So, you know, I I see that. Now, part of that now, do you feel like you got more or like how was the, was it different kind of feedback when when you had Fa in your videos and you were living in Thailand than you're getting now? Yeah. Unfortunately, the transition from Thailand content to van life content hasn't been smooth, but I 100% I 100 anticipated that. It's okay. I knew my Thailand audience may not be that interested, but I've made tons of new van life friends. I've met other van life vloggers. I've been in their channels or I've shared their content, and I'm slowly getting a van life audience now. But yeah, my feedback from some of my Thai people is, please go back to Thailand and far right now. You know, yesterday you should have been there. You, why? How could you leave Fod? How could you do this? And I get it. I understand. They're not me though, so I'm I'm doing what. But do I you think do. that those <clears throat> those people were watching your videos for her, or do you feel like they were watching those videos for you and in, in your oh, story? There's definitely a segment of my audience that watch for Fa, and I totally understand that. You know, she's a cute young girl and she's attractive and you know and she's swinging her butt in the camera i get it that's going to get certain type of viewers who are never going to watch a van life video in their life and that's fine yeah you know we, we no she that. was completely entertaining yeah. i mean i was like who is this girl like i didn't <laughs> i didn't understand the context the first time i watched it so i'm like i didn't even know what was going on <laughs> but i was like Dude, this place is a riot and then you know started to learn more and see that so now, do you have any, like, is she able, or what would it take for her to come here? Does she ever want to come to the U.S.? Oh, that's just, that's a way, way more complicated process than I would ever go okay. through. You know, you can do K-1 visa, and you can do a, I don't know, there's like a visitor visa. There's some visas out there, but yeah, they require Can't so Can't you do effort. like a tourist visa? Like, I mean, we can go to Thailand on like a tourist yep. visa. Couldn't they come here and just be like, okay, well, you could only be in the country for 30 days or whatever no, it is. No, unfortunately, it's, it's not that simple. You know, it, it requires a, a much lengthier process. They will, they can come here on a tourist visa, but a, obtaining that tourist visa will require a significant amount of effort. So it's not like, it's, is it their country makes it more difficult to leave? Or is it our country makes it it's, more it's difficult? It's our American entry requirements, yep. Which I didn't think there was one these days. <laughs> oh. Hey, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You know, but that's what sucks, though. You know, like, that's why I'm like, how I didn't know, like, yeah, it'd be awesome for her to come here, but it's so difficult. And you see the troubles and struggles that it would be to have her come and be able to experience this awesome journey that you're experiencing right now. However, the things that you have to go through to do that make it much more difficult. Yep. yep. And, and I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying there hasn't been many people that did it, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the effort. <clears throat> Fa has her responsibilities, her business, her things going on back there. So there's just no need. Now I take her to travel to other places and other countries and okay. we're going to do a lot more of that in the future. But yeah, coming to America, probably not like No. So I have this funny picture. Let's see if we can get that. I'm going to show it to you this way. <laughs> So enlighten me on how this van photo AI picture came about. So for some reason, Facebook Messenger has this new AI feature and I know okay. nothing about creating prompts or, or how prompts are supposed to go. So basically I just put in there, put a chocolate man in a van cartoon and it okay. spat out all this weird stuff. And that was one of the creations that it put out. And I was just like, what is this? <laughs> Like, I don't know what this thing is, but it is kind of what I asked for, but not really. It reminds me of like a garbage pail kit. <laughs> you know, like all of those things. That's what this uh, picture, that's where my mind went to was like the old school garbage pail kids. 
um, sort of thing. So now you mentioned to me that this is not your forever van. You're having fun in it. I mean, this is a low mile by four 40 Connell line um, van. What is it that would be your ideal van? Yeah, so I've really been looking at RVs. You know, before I hated RVs. I didn't want to do that at all. I was just going to build out this van or, you know, put a big four-wheel drive. I do all kinds of crazy stuff to this van and convert it and do all that. And now I'm kind of leaning, you know, I'm, I'm old and lazy sometimes. And I'm kind of a Gucci boy. As I said before, my friends, you know, they're very surprised that I live in a van. So I started, I saw on a channel, I saw this Pleasure Way prestige you know and they only built them for a couple of years but it, it's perfect for my gucci butt it's comfortable it's got a dry bath which i thought was incredible you know black and gray tanks just a really beautiful build on the inside and it's kind of beautiful on the outside and and i can still go down to well tech designs and get a suspension upgrade so i thought you know, that would work i know out. that we have done those and i tell you what i liked about that was like um, the seating area it was very accommodating for like four people it was like it was reminding me of like a good hangout van sort of thing um, where I was like oh this is cool because it has a big bed big room to sleep and also nice seating area I want to say it had a rear bathroom rear entry sort of deal so it was uh, it was definitely you know really nice van so I could see why you know you would you know love to do something you know like that so yeah of course we always hope you find a ford love a ford um you know otherwise you know the road tracks are you know really nice i don't know if that would be big enough you know to give you the room that you wanted i still feel like the road tracks are a little bit small you know for my own personal liking i do like those pleasure ways dual rear wheel setup you know a lot more load carrying capacity you know things of, of that nature um so I did have one more thing for you that you said that a man settles where he finds peace, not beauty, not money, not status, but peace. So James, do you feel like this van life has helped you find peace? Absolutely. So, you know, and that's, that's something I think you're, it's unfortunate. We don't realize these things. Well, most of us don't realize these things until later in life that all that money, status, power, you know, control things that, you know, your whole life you thought you had to have or things that, you know, were so important to you, you realize that's not what's important. That's not what's, it's doing what actually brings you peace. Now, if working your butt off and earning a lot of money brings you peace in your mind, well, whatever, good for you. For me, personally, yeah, being out amongst the trees and the squirrels and the bears and blue skies and beauty, I found I get more peace out of that than I do in a $500 a night Hilton hotel room. So, I prefer that. That's for me. That's how I'm finding my peace. Just being out there with God and His, what He created. Exactly. Just enjoying nature. it, loving yeah. it. No, I mean, I see some of these places that you go, and it uh, it is simply amazing. So I definitely thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me. I love learning, uh, you know, more about you. I mean, don't get me wrong. We could probably do this for another hour or more, um, especially like talking about Thailand. I mean, I'm so interested in, you know, other countries I haven't been and I would love to experience those. Um, and, you know, then we're going to have to have our Joe Rogan podcast. But I think for that one, we're going to have to be doing it in studio. So uh, maybe if you're ever in San Diego and want to come by. I would love for you to swing by WellTech. If anything else, just to say, what's up, guys? And, uh, you know, um, I got to get one of these really cool shirts that you got on, uh, you know. But, um, and I see, does this one still have the QR code on the, on the... Yeah, yeah, I got these made in Thailand. This is for the old channel, but yeah. I, okay. But easy to make. You can come up and scan you, so that way I can get a hold of you really quick, you know? Absolutely. So, no, that is awesome. Um, you know, big thing, thank you for your service. I appreciate that. Coming from a uh, military family, that's a big deal. And I uh, just want to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to uh, come hang out with me in my world up here in the attic. Thanks so much. I'm going to let you close out your name because you kill it. Way better than I do. <laughs> All right, y'all. Jay's Casino, chocolate man in a van. Salute.